good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Cohen. I'm a member of the class of 1987, and I want to welcome you to the annual Conradine von Gugelberg Memorial Lecture on the Environment. Thank you for being with us, whether you're here live or live stream. I'd like to tell you about Conradine and then introduce this year's speaker. Conradine was my friend and my classmate. He was an accomplished outdoorsman and a committed conservationist. He grew up in Switzerland where he earned an engineering degree and worked in a small manufacturing firm before coming to the GSB. He worked in venture capital and management consulting during and after his time in the MBA program. Now, when we were students here from 1985 to 1987, Conradine raised environmental issues in the classroom. This was a time where almost no one else did. Imagine that. He thought deeply about how new technology and smart management could reduce environmental impact. On a very grassroots level, after Friday afternoon LPFs, are there still LPFs at Stanford Business School? Stood for liquidity preference functions, otherwise known as beer blasts. Um, Conradine carried the only two recycling bins that existed at the Graduate School of Business up the stairs from the lounge to the courtyard and filled them with empty bottles and cans with or without other volunteers because he knew that otherwise they would end up in the regular trash. Conradine was a man ahead of his time. Before introducing this year's speaker, I'd like to thank the Center for Social Innovation for stewarding the fund and this annual event, the Alumni Association for covering our technical support, and the Woods Institute for their collaboration. Thanks as well to my co-founders and classmates from the class of 1987, several of whom are here this evening with us, and thanks to Conradine's friends and family in Switzerland who have given generously in Conradine's memory. Uh, a couple of bookkeeping items before I introduce our speaker. When we get to Q&A towards the end, please use the microphones that you find in the aisles. And after the lecture and the Q&A, please join us at a reception upstairs at the Obendorf Event Center for conversation and refreshments. Mark Tursek is the president and CEO of the Nature Conservancy, the leading global environmental organization known for conservation in particular, which works collaboratively to protect ecologically important lands and waters for nature and people. He is also the author of a best-selling book entitled Nature's Fortune, How Business and Society Thrive by Investing in Nature. Mark earned his bachelor's degree at Williams College. After a few years working in Japan, he returned to study for his MBA at Harvard, which you might know as that other business school in, in the East. Um, he then spent 24 years at Goldman Sachs, where he rose to managing director and partner. He worked as an investment banker for the first two decades, and then developed the firm's environmental strategy and led its environmental markets group. This was something new at Goldman Sachs at the time. And it, it occurred to me when I was uh, learning about Mark's background, that his official role at Goldman was much like Conradine's unofficial role at the time here at Stanford Business School. Mark then joined the Nature Conservancy, which I'll refer to as TNC for short, in 2008, revolutionizing the way TNC thinks about its impact and bringing a tighter strategic focus. Mark believes in the power of markets as a way to bring discipline to conservation. As former president Bill Clinton said about Mark's book, by breaking conservation down into dollars and cents, Mark Tursek shows that economic growth and environmental sustainability are not mutually exclusive goals. With this approach, TNC can better evaluate trade-offs and focus on activities that bring the highest returns for nature. Mark is also a proponent of impact investing in which money is channeled to organizations or projects that have positive social or environmental outcomes in addition to positive financial returns. 
With an investor's mindset, he is improving accountability in the environmental world. I'm looking forward this evening to learning more about how he is applying his deal-making skills and his market savvy to our enormous environmental challenges. Please join me now in welcoming Mark Tersek to the GSB for this year's Von Googleberg Lecture. Thanks very much. Thank you. Imagine this scenario. Two scientists working in California come up with a theory. They develop a hypothesis that certain chemicals are doing very significant damage to the atmosphere. Now, it's not a certainty, and they can't prove it. But if their theory is correct, and the evidence is pretty good, the changes would have huge and very dangerous impact on human health and human well-being. Now, the problem is there would be real and significant costs to addressing these challenges. There are some big and influential companies who are opposed to any action whatsoever. Governments are wary of stepping in. Consumers are concerned about potentially increased costs or reduced choices. Other countries, countries who are generally good allies of the US and things like this, they're skeptical about the science. And they say they're staying on the sidelines. But our two scientists keep plugging away. They compile more evidence. They get the attention of US regulators. These regulators, in turn, persuade the president of the US to press for international action. Within a few years, thanks to US leadership, nearly every country in the world signs an international agreement to fix the problem. Soon, this particular environmental cri crisis is addressed, the problem's put behind us, and we move forward. Now, some of you might be thinking, this is too good to be true. This is some kind of fantasy. But others of you, no doubt, realize what I'm doing is really I'm telling a true story. This is the story of the ozone hole. Um, and it's a story, I think, that holds some really good lessons for how we can overcome some of our biggest environmental challenges. Now, let's take a look, closer look at what happened. The two scientists in the 70s, they were studying chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs which at the time were used as refrigerants, and they were used in aerosol cans. The scientists discovered that CFCs really severely damage the atmosphere's ozone shield. And that shield protects humans from very uh, dangerous ultraviolet radiation. But other scientists were not convinced. The industries that produce CFCs, they were downright opposed. The stakes were huge. It was calculated that as many as 150 million cancer cases could arise from this challenge. Eventually, the US government, with broad public support, banned CFCs. Manufacturers hustled and innovated and quickly found alternatives to CFCs. Scientists kept plugging away, and they discovered, lo and behold, a hole in the ozone, which really galvanized action. It wasn't any longer just a theory. And our president, President Reagan led the effort for an international treaty to cut CFC production. The result? Global production of ozone-depleting substances has been reduced by 98%. Mission accomplished. Now, why did this work? That's what I want to talk about today. Not just the ozone layer, of course, but other environmental challenges we face right now, like water, biodiversity, climate change. But let's take one more look at that international treaty, one part of it. Notice who needed to come together to make this work. You had scientists, you had industry, environmentalists, governments from the developing world and the developed world. They all came together and struck a bargain, a bargain that paid attention to each player's individual needs. For example, in the developing poorer world, those countries were given a number of years to gradually phase out their CFCs. And the developed world created a multilateral fund to provide economic assistance to those developing countries to make that transition doable. In the developed world, well, in the US, for example, Congress put a tax on ozone depleting substances. So that made it possible for manufacturers of alternatives to more quickly compete in the marketplace. So the ozone story is not only a story of good science, it's also a story, and an encouraging one, of rapid technological innovation, and importantly, what I want to emphasize today, 
It's a story of successful collaboration. The result is, is you know, fantastic. A total solution to a potentially catastrophic environmental disaster. And it turned out to be relatively painless. It'll take decades for the ozone shield to completely heal, but the risk has been averted, and by the mid-21st century, ozone depletion will be a thing of the past. So, why doesn't this happen more often? Well, there are a number of obstacles that get in the way of us environmentalists, but the most important one in my view, and one that's in the power of environmentalists to address, is that we fight too much. In my view, the environmental community spends too much fi time fighting battles that don't need to be fought. Battles against government, battles against big business, battles against people who just hold different political points of view, even battles against different environmentalists, which really can be frustrating and crazy. I'm here to tell you, in my view at least, fighting is overrated, cooperation is underrated. Now, before we get into some real examples, let's ask the question, why is it that we fight so much? Well, first, environmentalists like me, we're very passionate about our cause. We believe protecting the environment is just the morally right thing to do. We think we're obliged to leave our kids and grandkids healthy ecosystems as, as good as the ones that we've experienced. And passion is a great thing for our movement, but passion sometimes gets, gets in the way of calm reasoning. It's not a problem at all when we're speaking to people who already agree with us. We're very good at this. Uh, we call it preaching to the choir, and we love our choir. We think they're the best people in the world. But our choir's not big enough to really scale our progress. We need to work effectively with all parts of society. And this, we're not as good at. Uh, when, we, when we work with folks who hold views other than ours, uh, we quickly start to lecture. Sometimes we criticize. And when we really get wound up, we vilify people who hold different views. Uh, guess what? That doesn't work very well in leading toward partnership and collaboration. Second, we environmentalists, I don't think we always use the right frame of reference. We're very quick to make analogies with movements like civil rights, ending apartheid, ending slavery. Those struggles, of course, really were fights between right and wrong. Now, to, to be sure, there are many environmental issues that are just like that. There are times to confront illegal whalers. There are times to chain ourselves to old growth forests. There are times to lie down uh, in front of bulldozers, removing mountaintops. Environmental campaigners can be real heroes. But that's not always the right approach. Where environmentalists sometimes go wrong, I think, is assuming that all of our issues fit the good guys versus bad guys model. I don't think they do. Often, for me, the better analogies are things like public health, applying science to halt the spread of disease. Take, for example, the effort in Nigeria to halt malaria, to combat malaria. Look at who's involved, the institutions who are involved, healthcare companies, governments, nonprofits, local and global businesses, multilaterals like UNICEF, global foundations like the Gates Foundation, religious leaders. Now, all of those players have very diverse views. But what they do is they put those diverse views aside and they focus on a common goal, ending malaria. I think environmentalists need to work that way too. A third reason we fight too much, uh, it's because we've, we've fought too much in the past. We've burned some bridges. Um, it turns out, if you sharply criticize or even vilify folks who disagree with you, especially if they think you're doing so unfairly, it's not so easy afterwards to cooperate with those same people in a trusting and open manner. We've trained these people to mistrust us, to fight with us. We face that challenge today, for example. Uh, a number of environmentalists, TNC is just one player. We're trying to work with the energy sector and the mining sector. Uh, we expect business leaders in these sec sectors to be enthusiastic partners with us in developing win-win solutions that aim to produce strong environmental and business outcomes. But bad feelings about past dialogues and general mistrust really get in the way of progress. Nevertheless, even if we haven't always approached collaboration in the right way in the past, I'm pretty optimistic that we can change course and do so right now. In fact, I think we're doing that. And we can really accelerate progress that way. So I want to look at three specific areas kind of quickly. 
um, water, biodiversity, and climate. And by the way, I'll note, I'm glad to be making these remarks here at the Stanford Business School. That's because I think business people and business students kind of naturally get this. Business people are naturally attracted to bringing people together in a respectful and pragmatic way to accomplish important goals. Business people do that every day. I think environmentalists can learn from them. Uh, let's start with the water challenge, probably on your mind. I'm not going to address your specific challenge, though, right now. Uh, let's go to Quito, Ecuador. So about 10 years ago, Quito is the capital of Ecuador. It's a booming you know, city. And um, about 10 years ago, the municipal water com company was concerned about how they would secure enough clean, healthy water for their rapidly growing population. And our local TNC team showed up with a really smart idea. I had nothing to do with this. I wasn't even at TNC yet. But the idea was really elegant. The local TNC science team went to the water company and they said, we think we have a better idea. The water company was about to build new plant and equipment to clean dirty water. And our science team said, we have a better idea. And they made an economic, not, a, not an environmental argument. Their economic argument was, instead of building that plant and, and, and equipment, Instead, invest upstream in protecting your watershed. That will be a lower cost way to secure clean water, and you'll get a whole bunch of co-benefits for free. So the water company was intrigued. TNC and the water company put up a little bit of money to begin working with ranching and farming communities upstream on changing practices to improve the watershed. Things like um, keeping cattle away from the river by putting up fences, uh, better ditching and, and, and vegetation along rivers to prevent uh, nutrient runoff into rivers. These kinds of interventions, stuff we know how to do. And all done in a way that worked for those local communities or they otherwise wouldn't do it seemed to be making some progress. So then we were able to recruit uh, the local beer company and the Coca-Cola bottler to join forces. So we had a little bit more money to work with. And it seemed to work well. And so then the municipal water company got regulatory approval to charge everyone in their water bill a fee for conservation. Now, important to note, had they built the plant and equipment, they would have been, had a, faced an even higher extra charge because the plant and equipment costs more. But in this case, they paid a fee for conservation and it read that way on their bill. And, and wonderful things happen. So now you have everybody in Quito kind of on our side, paying for conservation. The money's being invested upstream to change practices in a way that's good for that community and secures clean water. From a, this, is around when I, this is about the time I showed up in TNC. From a finance perspective, this was almost too good to be true. A very smart, small amount of philanthropic capital, which we uh, com committed at the beginning, got the flywheel turning and now we had conservation that paid for itself, if we don't screw up, in perpetuity. By the way, that upstream watershed where this was happening, the Bio Condor Reserve of Ecuador. So we could have tried to protect that area the old-fashioned way. We could have come and, and cr lectured and, and criticized practices of the, of the poor farmers and ranchers. Or we could have criticized the, the people in Quito itself for not uh, voluntarily funding these kinds of programs. Maybe it would have worked. But instead of doing that collaboratively, we rolled up our sleeves, worked together to solve a problem in a kind of win-win, respectful way. This was such a good idea that we said, boy, we should be able to rep replicate this. We now have 30 of these water funds across Latin America. Just a few weeks ago, we opened the Nairobi Water Fund in Africa. They're all a little bit different, but all variations of the same thing. Diverse parties who, who, who depend on nature for their water coming together to practically take care of water. Two other observations I'll make about this. One of our great partners is FEMSA. FEMSA is the Coca-Cola bottler, the dominant Coca-Cola bottler of Latin America, obviously concerned about water, concerned about their reputation, too, on water matters. So they became our partner, provided some funding. That's good. Had a lot of contacts in Latin America. That's good. But, but the reason I want to mention this is these collaborations do things that environmentalists can't do by themselves. For example, uh, FEMSA's headquarters are in Monterey. Monterey is kind of the industrial capital of Mexico. Turns out that Monterey has a water crisis too, different than Quito. Monterey's forests have been sadly degraded over the years. That forest had acted kind of like a sponge. And in rainy season, it would absorb water. And in dry season, it would release water. The sponge has been severely impaired. So now what happens in Monterey in the rainy season? Horrific, catastrophic floods. In the dry season, very bad um, droughts. So FEMSA, much more than TNC, FEMSA said, we ought to have a water fund in Monterey. And then FEMSA, not TNC, 
I don't think we would have been able to do this, to be honest. FEMSA recruited all of the industrial, leading industrial players of Monterey to cough up some $25 million to get a forest restoration project underway. And it's underway, and I have no doubt that it will be, they'll, they'll invest in this on an ongoing basis. So those are the kinds of extra benefits that come from this, this inclusive approach. There's another benefit, too, and, and one of the nice uh, comments in my introduction made me think of this. We learn, we environmentalists learn things from these partnerships that we wouldn't otherwise know. I remember the first time I met the CEO of FEMSA. Um, he's a business person. He's not an environmentalist. I don't think he has anything against us, but he is a business person. So we sit down, and he digs right in. He says, Mark, uh, we're going to be investing in, in nature to secure water, I understand. How much do we have to invest where to secure how much water? Which trees produce the most water? Should we plant new forests or protect standing forests? If standing forests, which ones? Do certain types of forests produce water on different time schedules? These are the kinds of questions business people ask. They're not the first things environmentalists think of. We really couldn't answer those questions at, at first, but we needed to. So we're proud uh, partners of Stanford in the Natural Capital Project. So NatCap is Stanford, University of Minnesota, TNC, and WWF. So we got Stanford scientists to dig in and help us answer those questions. We answered them. And now that's really enhancing our, this quality of work uh, that we do all around the world. That's my water example. It gives you a sense for what I mean of, of this, this collaborative rather than combative approach to scaling up conservation. Let's, let's turn our attention now to biodiversity. So the loss of biodiversity is obviously one of our biggest environmental challenges. There are lots of contributors here. Conversion of forests and grasslands to cities and farms, overfishing, pollution, climate change, poor funding of protected areas, poor, protect, poor protection of protected areas. Um, so the question is, what can we environmentalists do about this? So I think most environmentalists agree we need to first and foremost protect habitat. And let's protect especially biodiverse rich habitat, like rainforests. And if you think about rainforests around the world that are important to protect, most environmentalists would agree the Amazon, good place to start. What, pe what is less well known is historically, in modern times, the leading cause of deforestation in the Amazon is soy agriculture. As, as millions of people around the world rise out of poverty and enter the middle class, a good thing, they want and expect and, and buy uh, more protein-rich diets. And that's led to soaring demand for soy. Uh, and so that led to clearing a forest in the Amazon for soy agriculture. So this got the attention of good old Greenpeace in 2006. And as, I, as noted, there's a role for environmental campaigners. I really respect Greenpeace. Greenpeace, thinking about this and documenting it, began to uh, organize protests at McDonald's in Europe. The protests were themed like, did you know Ronald McDonald is causing deforestation in the Amazon? That got the attention of McDonald's. McDonald's <laughs> called Cargill, the, the global commodity trader, and said, we need sustainable soy. Cargill, somebody we've invested a lot in building relationship with, called us up and said, what are we going to do about obtaining uh, sustainable soy in, in Brazil? And so what happens then is Cargill and TNC, together then with other global soy traders, together with agricultural players in Brazil, together with Brazilian environmentalists, together with Brazilian farmers, everybody comes together and we come up with this soy moratorium. And this is 2006 about. Uh, everybody agrees for two years there'll be no international demand for any soy that's linked to deforestation. And that moratorium has been continually extended. And it's, it's been one of conservation's great successes. Deforestation due to soy has almost been brought to a halt, complete halt, uh, in the Amazon. We now face challenges. The challenge now is livestock. And by the way, we're going about it in the same way. Now, I don't mean to be sound complacent either. The, the challenge never goes away. Demand for soy continues to increase. There continues to be economic incentives for farmers in Brazil to do the wrong thing. The moratorium is not at is that risk, so you know we have to cut, fight the good fight. But we succeeded. We're now trying to do it with livestock, and even more excitingly to me, we've now turned our attention. This is the royal we: global companies, environmentalists, multilaterals, funding institutions. We've turned our attention to Indonesia's rainforest. Equally important, in Indonesia, the the culprit is is palm oil agriculture. And um, personally, I thought this, I, I was encouraged by the Brazil success, but this is tougher. There's no question it's tougher. 
But I think the approach is going to succeed again. Uh, the Global Consumer Goods Forum companies, so companies like Coke, Nestle, P&G, Walmart, all those big companies, whether you like them or not, uh, they've all agreed and pledged by 2020 they won't buy any palm oil connected to deforestation. Next, Cargill, good old Cargill, we got them in the game. But even more impressively, Wilmar, the Indonesian-based agricultural player, they've agreed they won't supply uh, palm oil linked to deforestation. Now we have the challenge of figuring out how with farmers, both big ones and small ones, we can make this work. How we can monitor it, it's always important, and how we can help farmers figure out how they can make you know, a living and good returns while farming on a basis that, that doesn't lead to more deforestation. And you know, the kinds of things we'll pursue, of course, we are pursuing more intense palm oil, a palm oil shifted expansion shifted to already degraded land rather than standing forest, et cetera. But it's another example of what this collaborative approach can achieve. And you know, we get a lot of grief for working with big ag. Big ag companies aren't popular. And people say, why would you ever work with Cargill? Well, first answer would be, had we not worked with Cargill, I don't know, I don't know how you could have made that progress in Brazil. I can't guarantee it wouldn't have happened, but I don't see how it would have happened. And then people say, well, are you saying you know, Cargill is a saint? No, Cargill's a business. They have now uh, under, their, uh, under their hat one impressive win in Brazil that they're very proud of. And we've encouraged them now to, to make the same uh, commitments in Indonesia, but they work all over the world. So TNC and others are pushing them to make that commitment a global one, and Cargill's considering it very seriously. But they're a business, and so they, they don't do these things lightheartedly. So they're neither saint nor sinner. They're a business, respectively engage, respectfully engaging in a dialogue with us. And I think it all leads to significant change. All right, my last example. I saved the hardest one for last, climate change. Now, um, first I just say, you know, environmentalists, we really beat ourselves up over climate change. We say, gosh, why haven't we solved climate change yet? And I think we just have to accept, you know, this is a little bit tougher. And it's not really an environmental challenge. This is a global societal challenge. We all have to be engaged here. And you know, it's a little bit harder. It's not like that ozone hole. That ozone hole, which would lead to immediate cancer, that gets people's attention. Climate, the climate consequences are more abstract, harder for people to appreciate, and a little bit further down the road, although less down the road every day. And the other thing we have to just you know, respect is that fossil fuels have done a lot of good for humankind. Here I am at an academic institution, so um, the historians of you can, could chart this out. If you created an index of human well-being, and you looked at things like lifespan and health and nutrition and these kinds of things, for most of human history, it's a flat bar. You know, Hegel said life was short, nasty, and brutish, and it was. And then suddenly the chart soars up. That's when fossil fuels showed up. That led to agricultural revolution. That led to the industrial revolution. That led to gains in, in health and wealth and prosperity. And so, uh, but of course now we understand that came with a, you know, a string attached. Those fossil fuels lead to these heat trapping gases, and, and that causes devastating climate change. But we have to understand, therefore, for those countries that have experienced the benefits of fossil fuels, this isn't an easy transition to achieve. And for those poorer countries who haven't even yet achieved those gains, it's an even tougher sell. And then there's other complications. The deep partisan divide in the US right now complicates matters. I think, in fact, we've made a lot of progress on the climate change issue itself. But what's happening, a lot of the debate is a surrogate debate about other issues, like trust in government or belief in science, et cetera. So this is complicated, but it's not really that complicated. In, simpler, in simple terms, we know exactly what we need to do. By 2050, global greenhouse gas emissions need to fall at least 50% below 1990 levels. Otherwise, we face some really severe risks. Further, I think we mostly know how to do this. We need to become more efficient. We just need to use less energy. It's a huge opportunity. As we use less energy, we'll save money. And there's you know, millions of ways to do this. Second, we need, clearly, to pursue new, new technologies and innovation so we can source energy uh, without carbon emissions. And then finally, and at TNC we believe this very strongly, we need to invest much, much more in natural ecosystems to sequester carbon. And there's really no good reason for anyone to be opposed to any of those three initiatives. So how do we get these efforts accelerated? Well, again, this won't surprise you. We need a better dialogue. Right now, too many people are yelling at one another. The problem is especially uh, acute. I live in Washington, D.C. now. 
I like, feel responsible for Capitol Hill. It's especially acute at Capitol Hill, and that, that dialogue is magnified by media coverage. I think that misleads a lot of people because, in fact, the kind of progress that I'm an advocate for is beginning to happen, on, and I think on an accelerated and very real basis. So there's reason to be cautiously encouraged. I don't mean to be Pollyannish, but I, I, think, I think there are a lot of positive trends that we can build on if we're smart. For example, about half the states in the United States today have renewable portfolio standards. These are programs that require the power sector to buy increasing amounts of their energy from renewables. You know, people argue the con of that is it's, it's, it's more expensive, but it's materially uh, letting those industries go down the cost curve and making those technologies um, more cost effective, and it's reducing emissions. Um, you know, and this isn't easy. My home state is Ohio. Governor Kasich is a Republican. Um, he was a champion of this, but now Ohio's renewable portfolio standard is on hold. So TNC and Environmental Defense, we're working together there, and, and we're, we're, in this respectful manner I, I described, we're trying to build support, bipartisan, centrist support for um, getting back on the original timetable for the renewable portfolio standard. But that's leading to a lot of good progress. About half the states. Solar energy. You, know, you guys know this because you're paying attention, but you know, so the cost of rooftop solar plummets. More and more, more and more states allow it. And there's interesting stuff happening in the solar space that social scientists are studying, and I think this is really exciting. Um, if you can, you can, I'm not, this is not my area of expertise, but you can learn about this. Social scientists are, are, are asking themselves, who's adopting solar and why? And so you have kind of less left-leaning consumers who say they're doing it for environmental reasons. Great. You have right-leaning consumers who say they're doing it to save money. Further, there's evidence if you challenge those right-leaning consumers and say, no, no, you're doing it for environmental reasons, it discourages them from doing it. So how you talk about these things matter, and people are beginning to figure that out. And the solar business is really being smart about this. Um, I think business is back in the game. Just when I joined TNC, we had this thing called the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, U.S. CAP. We didn't get it all right, but parts of it I thought were really impressive. We had about 25 companies, big carbon-emitting companies like GE, Duke Power, the auto companies, most of the utilities, chemical companies, together with a couple of environmental organizations, NRDC, Environmental Defense, TNC was one, and we pushed for a cap and trade. And our bill, uh, essentially it was our bill, passed the House, it was the Waxman-Markey bill, then everything went sideways. And I think we, we environmentalists screwed up a bit, everybody screwed up a bit. Uh, I think a shame that that didn't happen. And business, business sort of, um, I think the business leaders associated with us with, were disappointed or embarrassed, but they're getting back in the game. For a long time, a lot of the world's leading businesses have done the right thing individually. If you look at their disclosure statements, they recognize climate change is happening. Humans are causing it. We need to price on carbon. Here's what we're doing in reducing our emissions. All good. What people with jobs like mine have been doing is pushing those CEOs now to kind of come out of the closet and join us in pushing for policy. And I think that's just about to start happening. Last week, um, there was a World Bank Summit in DC. And some 30 companies, this, this came out of the World Economic Forum, some 30 companies um, officially together, uh, cross-section of global companies, uh, insisted on progress in, in climate policy and a price on carbon. I think we'll see more and more of that. It's very helpful for us. If I go to Capitol Hill and talk about this stuff, you know, I don't think people are that interested. They say, well, yeah, you're an environmentalist. And no surprise you're for this. But if I go this with a CEO from their, with a big facility in their state, we get their attention. Oh, and I'll mention Risky Business. Risky Business is the, um, the group doing uh, reports state by state. Now, its, it's leaders are Tom Steyer. I know he's a big Stanford guy. My old boss, Hank Paulson, and Mayor Bloomberg. And, um, and they're looking at the risks in a very concrete, scientific way, state by state, of what climate change will mean. And they're scaring the bejesus out of people in red states in a, in a simple, pragmatic, science-based way. I think that's helping. And then even on the far right, things are really moving more than I think people believe. There's a guy named Jerry Taylor. Check out his, he just published a paper, The Libertarian Case for a Carbon Tax. So uh, Jerry is ex-Cato Institute. He's friends with all those, those right-wing think tanks. And this paper says a couple of amazing things that really deserve more attention. First, in the climate science, Jerry Taylor says, it is resolved. Even the Heartland Institute 
agrees with him. Historically, they were like the, the red hot center of climate denialism. They say the science is resolved. Climate is changing, human activity is causing it. Check, done. Next, Jerry makes the case, any libertarian who's, who's, who's true to his guns has to be for a policy to deal with this because carbon emitters are damaging the property rights of others and, and libertarian principles call for the government to intervene in those circumstances. And then he makes some very good economic arguments. It's not, it's not as if doing nothing right now means no policy. Rather, we have a grab bag of complicated policy. We have the renewable portfolio standards I described. We have different kinds of subsidies. We have the new EPA regs uh, that are coming that are complicated. And, and Jerry Taylor's arguing, come on, this is silly. Put a price on carbon and let the market do its work and have the lowest cost solutions uh, dominate. And then Jerry reports to me that kind of the intellectuals on the right get it. So the politicians, I think, are likely not too far behind. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a laugh line, but I'll take it. Um, I need to wrap up so we can have questions. I think divestment is worth noting. I know Stanford, you know, Stanford was impressive here uh, to take leading action. We too, TNC, moved early. Uh, but you know, we're an environmental organization, so for us, I think it was kind of a no-brainer. But what I, you know, and, and I think there's lots of room for debate about divestment. What will it do? What won't it do? But what I think is good about the whole topic is, again, it's, it's elevating dialogue. So what I witness is, is college students pro-divestment, and then like their parents saying, no, here's why divestment's not the right tool. But what flows out of that is a good dialogue and better awareness of the need, the urgent need to address climate. I think it's a really positive trend. Then you know, I have more things, but I'll, I'll move on. Then people say, oh, but what can the US do alone? Well, then I, I point to the climate, the, the climate accord between the US and China. I think this is a huge deal. China has a pretty good track record of doing what it says it will do in, in their economic plans. Their current five-year plan calls for slowing economic growth in order to address environmental challenges. China has several cap and trade trade programs up and running. Now, let's face it, they have huge environmental challenges too. Again, no reason to be Pollyannish here, but China's in the game. Um, and I think a little bit of that, a little, that lesson here is a little bit of US, US leadership goes a long way. Anyway. My take on this is, um, I, I want to emphasize, I don't want to pretend the climate thing is going to be easy. But there's reason to be a little bit encouraged. And then what I want to argue is, there's reason to go forward in this respectful, inclusive uh, way that I'm talking about. Um, I'll tell you what we're doing at TNC. I'm, I'm proud of this. It's too early to take a victory lap. But it just so happens TNC in the US is organized state by state. We have a chapter in every state, just like Capitol Hill is organized. And in each of our states, we have a board of trustees. Uh, diverse people, one thing in common, they're passionate about nature, but they're just about equal parts, independents, Republicans, and Democrats. And they're diverse, business people, governmental people, you name it, scientists, environmentalists. Now, um, and then TNC, we're very proud, we've always been proud, this pr obviously precedes me, we've always been proud of our, our nonpartisan, centrist standing. We, we, we're regarded as pragmatic, science-based straight shooters. And so there was some nervousness at TNC about getting very involved in, in climate policy because it's a divisive issue. We've been great leaders, global leaders, in restoring forests to sequester carbon. We've been leaders in using ecosystems to adapt to climate change. But we were a little lower profile when it came to climate policy in the US. But starting now, each of our chapters, and this has been, this has been a tough issue for us, a lot of pushback. But starting now, each of our chapters has an explicit climate strategy, and that includes you know, so-called red states, uh, chapters like Arkansas, Missouri, Louisiana, Texas. I have to go there and talk with these trustees, some of whom are energy industry executives and who have not been on the, you know, have, have not been champions of climate. And I'm learning that to have a conversation with those folks, and they're good people, to have a conversation with them about climate change requires just what I'm talking about. Uh, respectfulness, finding common ground, putting differences aside, using science, trying to be pragmatic. And our experience is very encouraging, which again gives, gives me some, some optimism when I look forward. Now let me wrap up so we can open up for questions. Um, people often say to me, especially in DC, when I express views like this, oh, you're so naive. Um, it's funny, I worked at Goldman Sachs for a long time. We were called many things, but we were never called naive. <laughs> Um, well, I hope, I hope we're not being naive, um, and, and we don't have any choice but to do these things. But I think there is some evidence. Here's just one, one piece of evidence I'll note. Um, 
Election Day 2014. Uh, it was the biggest conservation victory day in U.S. political history. Uh, TNC is really proud of our work here. We worked in 19 states to approve, get voter approval of 27 conservation ballot measures that will dedicate over $29 billion to open space, water protection, parks, and trails. These initiatives achieved overwhelming success, including in red states like Texas, South Carolina, and Utah. Many of these measures passed with 65% of the vote or more. In many of these cases, people voted to raise their own taxes to pay for conservation. I think that's encouraging, and we're looking carefully at the toolkit that allowed us to achieve that victory so we can apply it in more contentious areas like climate. We can also take a very long view. Again, here we are at a great academic institution. Scientists like E.O. Wilson tell us that evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking, humans are not in particularly impressive mammals. <laughs> we're not very strong, we're not very fast, we're not very big. So how did our population expand to every region of the planet when no other species has ever done that? Well, scientists and anthropologists tell us it's our ability to act collectively to solve problems. We can solve environmental problems too, in my view, if we act collaboratively and collectively like we have throughout our species history. None of this is going to be easy, but the changes we need to make are within our reach. There's room in this effort for a diverse set of players, activists and scientists, liberals and conservatives, people like environmentalists like me who love nature for its own sake, or people who see it as a foundation for a sustainable economy. And importantly, and I'm thinking of this audience again, we need smart, pragmatic leaders who can rise above differences, who can reach out and build relationships with people and institutions who hold different views in order to develop the ambitious solutions I'm talking about. You might think these unlikely allies will never come together as effective forces for change, but I don't believe that. Every day I'm encouraged by, by stories I hear about or things I witness, people and organizations coming together, putting aside their differences, finding common ground, and making substantial progress on some of the world's most pressing issues. And if that's not enough for you, there's another reason to do this. De-emphasizing fighting, and instead working together with diverse parties to find common ground and to make things happen is not only a pragmatic way to work, it's a joyous way to live. Thanks for uh, letting me make these comments. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article in The New Yorker by Jonathan Fraser, uh, Fraser, I'm sorry, and he was arguing that the efforts that we're spending arguing about climate change and fighting it, including the business benefits, and now you have a lot of that community who's bought onto the risks, is actually hurting conservation efforts, which, I think the argument that he's making is actually a moral reason for doing it. Not, it has nothing to do with business or dollars. So you have this business versus morals. And as an environmentalist, you talked about both biodiversity and climate change. I guess, how do you reconcile the two? And do you see a risk in focusing on one and ignoring the other, which is more of a, a moral argument? Yeah, I read the article. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Franzen's a great novelist. I don't think he's such a good environmentalist. <laughs> um, I think he's just wrong. Um, I, don't, I don't see the work we do in climate as at odds with our other conservation initiatives. You know, California water issue is a good example, right? Um, you, you won't have success ultimately addressing your water issues if you ignore the climate challenges. I think these things are additive or they're, they're integrated and go together. So I don't see any evidence that Focusing on climate hurts the environmental cause. I do think focus, as people get, pay more attention to climate, uh, they pay attention to more environmental issues. So I actually see it more as a virtuous cycle. So I just think he's flat out wrong. Um, <laughs> but he's a very good novelist. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so I loved your story about the keto situation with the water stewardship and the, the avoidance of building the water treatment plant. How would you, or can you outline um, a solution that would be somewhat analogous to that, to um, gas extraction and hydraulic fracturing. How would you organize a collaborative uh, group to deal with that? It's a great question, and, and, and we are working on that. So um, I think natural gas is, you, there, there's, there are kind of two approaches environmentalists take with regard to natural gas. Some environmentalists just say no. 
they're having some success. In some places, they're stopping fracking. But broadly, fracking is happening. Um, our inclination is to say, how? How can you have fracking with uh, robustly safe environmental outcomes? And we believe it's doable, but it, reg it requires robust regulatory policy and enforcement and monitoring. And it even requires some enhancement in some of the more technical aspects of it. Um, but we think it can be done. So that's where we're focused. We're focused on the how. You know, there are a couple of examples. Colorado is a good one. So Colorado has um, it's a, big a lot of fracking going on there. Uh, it's kind of a mixed political state these days, uh, but Governor Hickenlooper is, is committed to fracking, but he wants it to be safe, and they've, they're making huge progress on methane leakage, which if you don't get methane leakage fixed, you don't get the climate benefits of moving from coal to natural gas. And the good news is all evidence is methane leakage can be addressed at very low cost, but it's not being addressed. So then we say, let's engage, and you have to do it state by state, because that's how the regs work, to get it addressed. We care a lot about habitat fragmentation, too. All those pads and wells and pipes can be a disaster for ecosystems. But because of horizontal drilling, these things can go for miles underground now. With a master plan, you can actually um, you know, kind of centrally locate the drilling activity in one place. You can avoid precious ecosystems. You can really have much better outcomes. So how do you do that? You have to bring the players together, the industry players, the regulators together, community groups, environmentalists, exactly along the lines I've described. And then what are the obstacles? It's kind of interesting. The most heat we take for those kinds of initiatives are from environmentalists who, who just say no. You know, so that, that we just work our way through. But I'm encouraged. I met with the governor of Pennsylvania last week, a newly elected governor, Governor Wolf, a Democrat, facing a Republican legislature. He, Pennsylvania's a big fracking state. It's been a huge boon for their otherwise struggling economy. He's, he's, he made huge commitments in his candidacy to address the environmental challenges of fracking, and, um, and won in a, in a time when I don't think many other Democrats won in Pennsylvania. So there's, it's, it's a lot of hard, messy work, but, but that's how we plan to move forward. Thanks. Yes. First, I just want to thank you for your remarks. Um, I wanted to ask you, following the critiques lobbied against TNC and Naomi Klein's latest book, your spokesperson said in the New York Times that the organization would ideally like to get out of the oil and gas industry altogether. Um, her allegations about drilling on conservation lands in Texas. And I was just curious what steps you're taking to do that. This, 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 that was a really like, annoying story by the New York Times. It, I won't get the facts exactly right, but Naomi Klein wrote a good and interesting book. This changes everything. Her view is quite at odds with mine, but she's smart and it's a good provocative book uh, worth reading. But in her book, she wanted to make in her book, uh, uh, she makes the allegation, I don't think this is the most compelling part of her book, but I'm biased, you can see for yourself. She, wanted to, she makes the allegation that Big Green, she calls us, we're, we're as much responsible for the environmental degradation that's happening as anyone else. I don't think she has great evidence, though. So her first piece of evidence, it's kind of a long story and an old story, but I think about 15 years ago, TNC uh, bought a big piece of land for conservation purposes. And, um, and on that land was an operating oil well. So at the time, this is way before me, this is even before my predecessor. At the time, the organization said, well, the well's operating. Um, we might as well let it continue to operate because it throws off revenue that will pay for the conservation. We're not a business. We have no magic source of revenue. We got to go beg for money, whatever we do. And so that didn't seem imprudent. And there was no evidence that that well did any environmental harm. Then move forward in time, but still way before me. Um, TNC was severely criticized for a bunch of things, including that well. So then the board of TNC said, gosh, even though that initial thing sort of made sense, it's, we also can see why people find it hard to understand why an environmental organization has that well. So we won't ever ha allow that to happen again. And then the final part of this story is the well, uh, something went wrong with the well, and the operator was legally entitled to redrill the well. And so then at that time, TNC sought legal opinion. Can we stop this operator? And the legal advice we got said, no, you'll go to court, you'll be sued, you'll lose a lot of money. Again, we're, we're, we're just a conservation organization. So we let that happen. Maybe that was a mistake. But again, we've pledged, not me, my predecessors pledged, we'll never do this again, and we never have done it again. So now fast forward to last year, Naomi Klein's come, book comes out. That's her leading piece of evidence. That, that were the culprits. I think it's a big, uh, a big distraction, to be honest. We've got millions of acres of land, and on one, there's a well operating, um, and there you have it. That's the story. But is that your only connection to the oil and gas industry? No. I mean, oh, that's, that's a different my, question. My question was 
What? No. Your spokesperson no. said in the New York Times that you're trying to move away from oil no, and gas. No, we didn't say that. No, I, you misread that. There's no way we said that. So we work but, with companies like right now we're working, we're working, I think, heroically in the Gulf to restore ecosystems. And so we're doing things with like players like Shell Oil to use oyster reef restoration rather than seawalls to protect their facilities. And the environmental benefits from that are huge. Why would we work with Shell? Because they're going to make an investment in infrastructure to protect their, their facilities one way or another. And we think we can show them using our science that investing in nature is a better deal than investing in, in um, gray infrastructure. And if we're right, assume Shell does it, and we're right, and it works better, other companies will in, imitate them, and that can scale up and change the world. Per my remarks, we would never say we're not working with a company like that. One of my friends is Kumi Naidu. He's the head of Greenpeace. A South African had been very involved in the anti-apartheid movement. He is, um, you might doubt my credibility in these matters. I'm from Goldman Sachs. I asked Kumi Naidu about this, and he said, look, Mark, this is easy. With regard to companies or with regard to anybody else, have no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. <laughs> but if you can make progress, make it. I think you're wrong about the quote in the Times. We were talking about that, that technical matter about the well on one piece of property. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nadine. I'm an MBA student here, and I really appreciate your push to encourage collaboration. But I was curious how you look at the role of Greenpeace in getting the deals in the Amazon and now progress in. We loved it. Well, I mean, but a lot of what started that conversation was their very adversarial yeah, tactics yeah, exactly. and putting a lot of pressure on companies. And, and that's 100% sort of what fan. I, I thought I said that explicitly, and I write about it in my book. And I, I know I said it because I was reading my speech. There's a role <laughs> for campaigners. There are bad actors in the world. Now, everybody's not a bad actor, but there are bad actors. And governments sometimes don't do their job. And so there's a need for environmentalists to campaign against those players. But that's circumstance specific. Greenpeace, for example, I have a lot of respect for Greenpeace, and you're exactly right. That Brazilian success, Greenpeace was a key partner and the initial player. But Greenpeace has also successfully worked with uh, those same companies they campaign against. I, I just quoted Kumi. No permanent enemies, no permanent friends. No, there is a role for campaigners. Don't get me wrong. I have huge respect for Greenpeace. Yes? I think a lot of people think the uh, ethanol from corn program was pretty disastrous, raising yeah. prices and all. And I'm wondering if you agree. And if so, what lessons did, uh, can we learn from that? Um, TNC has been really involved there. I haven't been so involved, but we, want, we wrote one of the, the seminal science papers that, um, that kind of showed the folly of, of the subsidies for ethanol. I, I, I'm not really an expert. I think it's more a political challenge now. Um, you know, farm states with political clout aren't, aren't giving that up easy, and we just got to keep fighting for more rational policy. I don't personally have a lot to add, but I agree with the premise of your question. Yes? Um, to get these business organizations to talk to you, there has to be a reason that motivates them to sit down. There was maybe a little bit of a, a hint of what that was here with Greenpeace, but why do they talk to you? Oh, they You know, business, so like the palm oil, for example. Yeah, businesses have a bunch of reasons. So businesses first, you know, business people, if they're not, if they're not kind of forward thinking and science and evidence based, they don't really keep their jobs for long. So most business leaders of big companies understand environmental challenges are severe and they're not going anywhere and companies are going to have to deal with that. So I mentioned our work with beverage companies in connection with water. They get it. There are going to be water challenges and they better have a game plan and they better be showing, uh, you know, their right, right to operate. They better show their customers and their communities they're trying to do good things. Businesses recruit for people. So I'm sure a lot of great businesses come to Stanford to recruit students and, you know, young people want to work for companies whose values align with theirs. Businesses care about costs. In most of our interventions, we're very confident we can show that doing the right thing environmentally more than pays for itself. These things make business sense. Now, business leaders don't always get that. I think business leaders can be too timid and too short-term minded about understanding the business opportunity. So that's where we come in hard. And we say you're not being bold enough. And that's where campaigners can help us get their attention. So again, we welcome the campaigner's engagement. But, but, but this is mostly old news. Um, most business leaders get it now. And it's like, my Cargill example is a good one. They've had a couple of great successes under their belt. And so now we're pushing them. Hey, if it worked for you in, in, in jurisdictions A, B, and C, why aren't you doing it everywhere? And, and, and they know their, their own employees care about that. Their customers care about it. 
Um, I mean, I think, I think, I think here it's, it's almost old news. Businesses get it. Uh, doing, the, doing the right thing environmentally, it's increasingly clear, clear, is a compelling business case too. That's sort of what a lot of my book is about. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, the, it sounded like you thought, I want to return to the campaigner question. The, campa the campaigners clearly play a, a big role. Sometimes people say, gosh, aren't there too many environmental organizations? And I say, no, really, it's a big world. And the environmental challenges are, are, are difficult. And there's sort of an, there's an ecosystem of environmental organizations, each playing different roles. It's hard for us to play one another's roles because we're organized differently. We have different kinds of strategies. So we stick to our different strategies. But there's, there's um, room for a very diverse environmental community. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, uh, my name is Diane. I'm uh, finishing a PhD in uh, conservation uh, management. And I'm very interested in um, like future studies, exponential technologies, and how the digital revolution has been impacting uh, several industries. I was wondering, what is your opinion on um, how the digital revolution, and including the um, increasing um, knowledge or development of artificial intelligence, nanotech, biotech, um, are gonna can impact the conservation field, uh, and how can we h harness better the capacities of the of the these technologies to improve conservation and solving uh, these problems? And the second part is, uh, do you have a strategy in TNC to um, maybe innovate using these technologies? Yeah, or? it's a really good question. So I would say, now here, uh, I've been bragging about environmental organizations. I don't think this is our area of strength, in part because nonprofits, we, um, we don't, we're, funding is a real issue for nonprofits. I mean, we happen to be a big organization, but big organizations are just as resource constrained as small ones. And so I think we have tended to make a mistake and invest too little in these kind of game-changing opportunities, technology probably being the best example. So what we're now doing at the Nature Conservancy is through our science function, partnering with, with scientists in academia to better understand what technology can do for us. So it's sort of on the come. And I mentioned NAPCAP, so that's one good partnership we have, uh, really emphasizing technology, but we have new initiatives underway. There are a couple of things that are kind of obvious. First, obviously these tools can be used to build awareness uh, that's good, really good, right, to get more people on. I think that's already helping. By the way, that's why one reason business businesses don't try to cheat as much anymore. There's a, it's a transparent world. You're not going to fool anyone. But we, we think we can get more people on our side through better communication. And then monitoring and enforcement is always a big deal in conservation. You know, in many jurisdictions, we have the right rules. The bad things are illegal, but they happen anyway. And enforcement, like in fisheries, enforcement is so difficult. But you can imagine drones materially enhancing uh, efficiency. Even here in California, we, we had a, it's in my book, we had a big fishing success, but we're using, um, all, the fisher, all the fishing guys have iPads and to, to, to track and share real time what's happening in the fishery. But I would say this is a huge opportunity for the environmental movement. NGOs like ours will probably um, underinvest in this. At knowing that, at TNC, we're aggressively trying to partner with academic institutions. I hope the private sector will step up and help us. In China, on our board are Jack Ma of, of Alibaba and Pony Ma of Tencent, China's leading consumer technology companies. So we're asking them to take folks on their teams and, and put them to work with us to make rapid progress. So stay tuned. I, I think we, we really have to accelerate our progress. There, there are several of us in the Valley that would love to help with technologies and, and maybe borrow on your spirit of collab collaboration on the biodiversity. I, I've been to Belize to look at mantes. I've been to Costa Rica to look at leatherback turtles, Mexico to look at humpback whales. I'm always in a boat, gas-powered boat, with yes. PhD students for hours yes. noting what they see yes, and bad. taking temperature. It's, it's Luddite technology. Yes, yes. Um, you're right. And it's easy, I'm a venture capitalist. It's easy to put together five or six technologies. Okay, let's talk afterwards. Go out and just, and, and, and and fail forward, just test a bunch of stuff. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm sure you're right. So I'm kind of embarrassed now, but um, <laughs> a couple of months ago, I would have been more embarrassed. I'd, it finally dawned on me, we better get going, and hey, I'm the boss, so we're moving. So we'd love to talk about that, though. But I, I, it's just a nonprofit thing. Um, it took me a while to get used to this. Nonprofits, we rely on donors for our funding, and a lot of the most sophisticated donors in the world believe they, shouldn't, they should only fund programs and nothing that can be viewed as, quote, overhead. And, and they're just, their definition of overhead is so wrong. And so these kinds of forward 
leaning, sense-making investments are very hard, hard to raise funds for. But there we're making progress. So now we're kind of assertively going to our most sophisticated donors and say, this makes no sense. You've invested tens of millions of dollars in our programs, but not in strengthening our organization. You would never do that in, in your business life. And so I think we're going to have more success fundraising. And then, we, and then at TNC, this is also kind of interesting. We used to hire uh, scientists, but they were all like kind of conservation scientists, environmentalists, biologists, that type. But now, you know, the kind of work I'm talking about, we need social scientists, we need economists, we need uh, technologists. So I, I think our field is going to get exciting and much more dynamic going forward. And then to, it doesn't look like there are that many business school students here. But for people in school right now, I, I think this is really going to be an exciting field because I think everything is going to change. You're exactly right. Anyway, I'm sorry for answering questions so long. But there, I, I'm going to go to the reception. So I'm happy to chat with you. Again, thanks very much for the opportunity to chat with you.